the launch of a new coal mine in Australia has divided the country. No more coal! No more coal! We have to take stronger action, civil disobedience. They are over here pleading with our governments not to build new coal mines. We have a responsibility to them. An energy giant seeks to generate electricity in India and create jobs across Australia. The opportunity is to feed the very, very best coal to those plants. We have an industry to be super proud of. Adani is a revolution for us in central Queensland because it's going to give job opportunities. But some fear the impact on Australia's natural resources. Our own government is destroying the Great Barrier Reef. We've lost about half of all the corals of the Great Barrier Reef. With communities bracing for impact, in their neighbourhoods. Yeah, that's a water bomber. He's gone back to the airport to refuel because there's a fire still going over the back there. In 30 years, when we've got raging bushfires, our water's running out, we can't grow crops anymore. Can the Australian government fight the realities of climate change? We're getting more cyclones, we're getting uh, monsoonal events, and climate change is a big issue. Queensland, Australia. Suburbs in the southeastern tip of the country are engulfed in bushfires. Catastrophic hot, drought like conditions with wind speeds of 90 miles an hour. The fires spread fast. People are evacuated to safety, while more than 20 homes are burnt to ashes. Rescue services use aerial bombers to douse the fires, now spread over 4,200 acres. An emergency is declared in vast swathes of Queensland. In May 2019, 65% of Queensland was declared to be in drought. Water supplies for farms and homes are running dry. We travel to Stanthorpe, a suburban town two hours from Brisbane, to investigate the impact of this heat wave. Behind a number of homes uh, in those two locations, the Pingowra and Woolaway. That's James Morris from the New South Wales Rural Fire Service giving us the latest update on those three. The severity of dwindling water supplies can be gauged by the signboards that welcome us. As we arrive, firefighters leave to douse raging fires nearby. Stanthorpe's community meeting is called. Local police and the mayor have urgent announcements. Exclusion zones, and I can't stress enough, they are exclusion zones for safety reasons. We've got trees that have been burnt out in those dry root systems that could easily fall over on cars. There's power lines down. You can see the direction the wind was going and it with speed and with um, ferocious flames. The residents are holed up inside the centre, unsure if their homes have survived the blaze. While outside, water bombing continues. As fires briefly subside, 
70-year-old Kerry Stratford is allowed back into her home. This was all a light on Friday night I watched all this burn. And that house that's up the top there is called the Eagle's Nest. And I'm surprised the Eagle Nest escaped because that was just burning. They had to call the fireys back there yesterday to put some stuff out. But it got up to there, it stopped there. So there must have been a heap of fireys here. See that brown thing behind those rocks? That's melted, there's a little car. That's a water tank. It's melted. The top of it's melted and there's water in it. That's how, that's how hot the fire was. Kerry's home miraculously survived. The fire stopped a few metres from where she lives. When you're faced with not having a home to come back with, and that's the thing, that's still getting to me, how lucky I am that my home survived. I've got my late husband's voice on that. That's the only thing I've got of hearing him talk. And that was when it snowed here on the 17th of August, 2015. That's when it snowed. They evacuated those people out of there. The hardest thing is when you get the knock on the door. You know it's coming from the police saying, get out. And I said, oh, yeah, I'll get, I've, I've got everything packed, everything ready. And he said, well, make sure you go. Stantop's remaining water supply is being sacrificed for firefighting. Well, the fact that we've been in drought up here for so long, we haven't had decent rain for a oh, good two years now. Um, we've had spasmodic rain. Our dam, if you go just have a look at Stone King Dam, um, that'll shock you, because that's really shocking out there. We're on wa severe water restrictions. We'll be out of water at the town here by December. And I don't know if they're using the water from our dam out there to fill the fire bombers for this. I don't know where they're getting the water from. The fires have shattered livelihoods, animal habitats, water supplies, and agriculture. According to the Climate Council of Australia, economic loss due to reduced agricultural productivity is projected to exceed $19 billion by 2030. 211 billion by 2050, and 4 trillion by 2100. Reusing water has now become the only way to survive the drought in many parts of the country. Still, my bath water's in there, because I saved that. Right, and then I use my bucket that I've got there. In my washing machine, I'll have to give that a rinse out. There's, there's all ash inside there from the fire from the ash that come through. So I bucket it with that bucket in there, wash my clothes in it, hang it out, then put it out into the bucket and then it goes on what plants I've got to keep alive. That's the only way you water a plant. You're not allowed to outside water your plants. There's no doubt the climate is evolving. It is changing. But I know that we're getting a few degrees warmer each year. You know, we've, we've noticed a big increase in the, in, in the global warming. But I don't know how you stop that. Um, there's something definitely happening with the Earth. The State of the Climate 2018 report for Australia reveals a land surface temperature increase of one degree Celsius. That's led to hot, dry conditions, perfect for bushfires. The science was saying then that if we keep putting carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere, the temperature will steadily increase there will be more frequent extremes, more very hot days. There'll be changes to rainfall patterns. So the science was saying 30 years ago that Perth, Adelaide, Melbourne, the southern cities of Australia would get drier, and that's all happened. Already, Australia is ranked the seventh highest carbon emitter per capita. One big reason, coal-fired power plants. Coal provides fuel for about 70% of electricity production in Australia. A majority of these plants are located in the state of Queensland. The state has a historical relationship with coal. Mining began here in the 18th century. Behind most coal mining operations lay years of struggle and toil. This coal earned royalties for the Queensland government and sparked development across the country. But today, 
the region is a shadow of its past, with coal jobs lost to automation. Still, coal production continues to grow to feed a hungry market abroad. Now, instead of reducing Australia's carbon footprint, the Queensland Premier has promised to open new coal mines in her state. It's part of Anastasia Palaszczuk's plan to create thousands of new jobs. But at what price? Australia is the world's largest exporter of coal, a commodity that's aided the rise in temperatures worldwide. Coal-fired electricity generation accounted for 30% of global CO2 emissions, according to the International Energy Agency, resulting in record temperatures of 40 degrees Celsius in Australia, leaving the residents of Stanthorpe desperate for water. As rescue services scramble to save lives, Queensland's Premier calls for an emergency press conference. So we have uh, a number of families at the moment that are actually going through um, some really traumatic times. So we are in the process of trying to reach those families. We understand that they're all safe, but they will be going through um, a lot of grief at the moment, and I know that our community will pull together and uh, definitely make sure that they get back on their feet. Uh, we're filming a documentary from Singapore, from Channel News Asia. Just wanted to get a comment from you about uh, the increasing number of coal mines resulting in rising temperatures. Do you feel that they, this is a direct impact of that? Well, we do know that climate change has a big impact. We knew that um, from the, we're getting more cyclones, we're getting uh, monsoonal events, and climate change is a big issue that everyone signs up to in terms of keeping with the Paris Treaty. But the latest addition to Queensland's coal industry has incensed thousands of anti-coal protesters across the country. No coal! No coal! No coal! After the break, we investigate the politics of coal in Australia. Two-thirds of extreme weather events in the last 20 years were caused by human activities. The Paris Agreement signed in 2016 aimed to curb emissions to minimize temperature rise by 1.5 degrees. If current trends continue, the world is likely to pass the 1.5 degrees Celsius mark between 2030 and 2052, unless it finds a way to reach net zero emissions. Amid this alarming situation, the state of Queensland announced new coal mines to boost the economy and create jobs. That's when Indian billionaire Gautam Adani announced plans to build a mine at Carmichael, a rural outpost in the Australian outback. At the time, Carmichael was to excavate 60 million tonnes of coal a year. That figure has since been scaled down. In effect, what we're building now is a 10 million tonne per annum coal mine. We're just one of 125 operating coal mines in Australia. We'll be building 200 kilometres of greenfield rail construction to tie into the existing network. So combined, that will represent around a $2 billion Australian investment uh, to be able to get us into production, and we'll see that coming online in 2021. The mine would be located on the Galilee Basin, 160 kilometres northwest of Clermont. It will also feature a rail line connecting the mine to the Abbott Point Terminal. The opening of the Carmichael mine is expected to attract more investments in the mining sector, which activists say would increase greenhouse emissions that trap heat and make the planet warmer. Roughly 30% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions came from electricity production from coal and gas in 2018. Australia's mining sector once the backbone of the economy is in a long, protracted slump. I think a lot more businesses are going to close, which a lot have already closed, haven't they? Doug? Like, they've had to close the doors because of, the, there's no people in the town. People have to move away because there is nothing here, you know? Um, so, the younger generation's got no future. Yeah, that's right. The younger generation of Bowen 
They've got nothing. What have they turned to? Well, look around. I mean, the town's dead. Completely. Completely dead. And uh, the town needs employment real bad. There's nothing here for the younger generation. They all leave town. Adani announced thousands of jobs to be created over the next few years. A prospect much welcomed by the mining community. The pro-Adani movement was centred around jobs, uh, jobs for the community. Um, Claremont's a very strong mining town. I think it was founded uh, on copper mining back in the 1800s and obviously then gold. And the people of Claremont, following the investment and in town um, and the ability for those people to gain jobs, um, was very pro-Adani, I think. I, I believe that mining's important. I, I don't think that it's sustainable to think that we can go straight from coal-fired power to natural resources like wind or solar, but I think they should work hand in hand. A number of people locally uh, work in the mining industry, so uh, a lot of them are, are quite keen, I believe, to get more jobs going um, in that area. Unemployment here hovers above 9% compared to around 6% in Queensland as a whole. That's why Bruce Hedditch is busy promoting the Adani mine. He started the Go Adani campaign. It's going to generate a lot of job opportunities for central Queensland. The Queensland government last year received $3.8 billion in coal royalties from, from, uh, from uh, coal mines throughout this state. $3.8 billion. Uh, next year, the Queensland Government will spend $3.9 billion on interest on loans. Now, the opponents of Adani and coal are asking us, as a community, to stop coal exports, stop the royalties coming through. I would love someone to tell me where the $3.8 billion is going to come from. For a town devoid of jobs, it's a polarising question of unemployment versus the environment. There are questions about whether or not the mine will pay appropriate royalties or any royalties to our state government and uh, huge concerns about the fact that there won't be that many jobs provided and that the company has effectively massively exaggerating, uh, exaggerated the jobs that they say it would, it would provide. Adani's initial promise of thousands of new jobs was challenged by a court testimony. An affidavit alleged that Adani Mining's billion-dollar Carmichael coal project would have 483 full-time equivalent jobs, while Queensland as a whole would have 1,206 full-time equivalent jobs. We'll see over 1,500 uh, direct jobs created during the ramp-up and construction for the mine and rail and a further 6,750 indirect jobs. So in total, what we're talking about is 8,250 jobs invest in, injected into the Australian economy, in particular in regional Queensland, and, and specifically in areas that have typically got high levels of unemployment. And we're talking about areas that have approached close to 10% levels of unemployment. So the project's certainly very important for Australia and for Queensland and regional Queensland as it relates to jobs. Jobs aside, TV journalist Mark Willisey has news that's far less hopeful. He tracked developments on Adani mining elsewhere. The company was charged in Zambia with polluting a major river and convicted. Um, under Australian law, if you um, have any convictions or issues involving mining and you're in charge, you have to declare that. That was not declared by this particular Adani executive at the time. And that culminated recently with Adani being charged and it's going to be prosecuted for supplying false and misleading information to the state government here in Queensland. The state of Queensland imposed hundreds of environmental conditions for the Carmichael mine to adhere to. Particular attention was paid to Adani's surface water use and the mine's proximity to the Great Artesian Basin. The Great Artesian Basin is the biggest underwater resource in the world, stretching over 1.7 million square kilometres. It is 3,000 metres deep in places 
and is estimated to contain 65,000 cubic kilometers of groundwater. The basin provides the only source of fresh water to much of inland Australia. Underground coal mines rely on water to reduce the risk of fires or explosions by using it to cool the cutting surfaces of mining equipment and prevent coal dust from catching fire. So we know about water being very precious. The Adani mine would um, suck up as much water as the rest of the users in the whole catchment and they don't have to pay as much for it because our state laws are very lax and give a whole lot of freebies to mining companies for reasons that we can go into later, mostly because they make generous donations to both sides of politics. We will not be extracting water from the Great Artesian Basin. We don't have any plans, we don't have any authorities, or we don't have any approvals to extract water from the Great Artesian Basin. There are instances where we'll have to extract groundwater simply to be able to allow mining to be undertaken safely. So it's simply for safety reasons, not for water extraction reasons. And outside of that, all of our water will be sourced uh, from surface sources. Tom Collins, a former Queensland water chief, estimates the mine may tap on a substantial amount of the state's water resources. When Adani starts to extract coal and uh, intercepts the Great Artesian Basin aquifers, water will flow out of those aquifers into the mine pits and Adani are allowed to extract unlimited volumes of water out of those mine pits to keep their mining operations safe. Adani there, the modelled uh, extraction of water over the life of the mine is 270 gigalitres. That is equivalent to around about 55% of Sydney Harbour. Animal grazers like Bruce Curry rely on the Great Artesian Basin for their water supplies. He lives in Speculation, a rural outpost in the Australian outback. People can't exist without water. If you want to know what I'm talking about, turn your water supply off for two days and try and survive, regardless of where you are, because what's happening here, they're turning our water off for perpetuity. When they destroy it, it's gone forever. Along with wife Annette, the Curries have been running this farmland for generations. This is the coal seam they, they want to dig out. It's the D coal seam. This is where we draw our water from, which is the clematis sandstone, and that is part of the feed into the Great Artesian Basin. The only thing is, once they, they mine that coal seam out, they have a process called long wall mining. And what it does is, once the coal comes out, they just collapse all the strata above it. So what that'll do, it'll drain that clematis sandstone. So basically, it'll destroy our water supply and it'll destroy part of the feed into the Great Artesian Basin and uh, which will impact on the integrity of the Great Artesian Basin. Bruce's worries about destroyed water supplies inspired him to go on a fact-finding walkabout overseas. He wanted to see what the future of speculation might look like way out in India. I went to India a few years ago to actually have a look at the uh, Adani operation and to talk to, my main concern was to talk to communities and farmers over in that area and um, get a, a good understanding of the company that would be coming. When I was in India, we went to uh, the Adani Special Economic Zone up there in the Gulf of Kutch and I spoke to fishermen there and they highlighted to me there the pressures and the, the uh, impacts that they're suffering because the Tatars as well as the Adanis have built a power station there. They actually release their hot water out into the ocean and which kills the um, juvenile fish, fish eggs, and has a, a big impact on the, the fishing communities that are trying to survive on that source of income. They're also not doing anything about the fly ash that's coming out of their smoke, their, the stacks of the power station, and that fly ash is going across farmers' lands. Bruce is unsure if similar damage to the Great Artesian Basin is reversible. Once the mine starts and the dewatering starts, uh, whether that their findings are accurate or not, they cannot repair the damage. And the water is mined forever. It's lost for perpetuity. 
that regardless of how big their mistake is, they cannot rectify it, they cannot correct it, and the impacts is there for perpetuity. As the climate gets hotter and drier, water is even more precious. Farmers like Bruce want their groundwater to be protected from any damage. It is a shame that more people aren't aware of what the Great Artesian Basin's all about. It's, you know, one of the biggest freshwater, underground freshwater sources in the world. And it's not polluted, it's not contaminated. It's environmental terrorism. For the money we've made and the life we've lived on spec, and to think that they could just, through the flick of a pen, take that away from us, it's not fair and it's not right. Like when you went to India to have a look at those poor farms over there, I don't begin to understand how that has affected their family. What will we do? After a prolonged legal battle, the Adani Carmichael mine has received the environmental clearances it needs. But the opposition to its construction continues. After the break, we go underwater to investigate the impact of rising greenhouse gases on the Great Barrier Reef. Well, there's parts of the Great Barrier Reef where you can uh, drive in a boat or, or swim for kilometres without seeing a living coral. Indian energy giant Adani wants to mine Australian coal, planning to export it back to India. Adani is the largest private thermal power producer in India, with an installed capacity of more than 12,000 megawatts. But they're ramping up production in India. Adani stands to gain from the rising need for power in developing South Asia. To fill the gap in supply, it's looking at Australian coal. Clear coal will be shipped through uh, Abbott Point port operations. It's been operating for over 35 years in an environmentally responsible way. There's thousands of ship movements through the Great Barrier Reef every year. So you know, the, the prospect that our, the shipment of our coal through the Great Barrier Reef is going to have a di direct impact on the reef is just a falsehood. To export this coal, Adani signed a 99-year lease with Abbott Point Terminal in 2011. The deal cost Adani roughly two billion Australian dollars. A few years back, there was a plan for massive expansion of ports in the Great Barrier Reef, and there's basically six big ports already. And there was a hope by industry, um, with their hand being held by government, to expand those ports to ship more coal out and more liquefied natural gas out through the Great Barrier Reef to world export markets. Now, the problem with making ports um, bigger and deeper is that it requires a huge amount of dredging. So the huge impacts from that dredging were um, a very, very big concern to marine scientists. The developments surrounding Abbott Point Port are being keenly watched by coral expert Charlie Verin. That's because of Abbott Point's close proximity to the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. The Great Barrier Reef is the world's largest coral reef system composed of over 2,900 individual reefs, large enough that it can be seen from outer space. This is the world's biggest single structure made by living organisms. Reefs occupy just 1% of the world's marine environment, but they provide a home to a quarter of all marine species, including unique fish, turtles, and algae. A large part of the reef is protected by the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, which helps to limit the impact of human use, such as fishing and tourism. The reef has lost more than half its coral cover since 1985. High temperatures cause mass coral bleaching due to warm ocean waters. A coral reef is a very competitive environment. Everything competes with everything else all the time. So corals have got this symbiosis with the algae and that produces food and oxygen. But if you raise the temperature just above 
the absolute temperature tolerance that the corals have, the algae produce too much oxygen and that kills them. We head out to investigate the effects of rising temperatures on the Great Barrier Reef. Charlie Verin is out to collect evidence. He's hoping the remaining reef might be spared from rising temperatures. Well, there's parts of the Great Barrier Reef where you can uh, drive in a boat or, or swim for kilometres without seeing a living coral. So the worst affected is total death of the whole reef. And we see that in a few reefs, uh, but the majority of reefs of the Great Barrier Reef have not been wiped out by any means, but they have been quite severely damaged. Reefs protect coastlines from flooding during extreme storms, which is why saving corals is critical. As the seas warm, and they're warming gradually every year, the, the increase that threatens corals warms incrementally just each year. It gets more and more threatening. And whether that kills the coral or not depends on the amount of time it's exposed to these maximum conditions, maximum temperature conditions. That varies in patches all over the ocean surface, and it, but it is increasing year by year, and that will continue. Charlie is now retired, but has spent his life raising awareness of coral bleaching. The other is um, direct lying, direct telling of lies by politicians. When, for example, um, uh, politicians say that Australia is meeting all its obligations under the Kyoto, under Paris Agreement, um, Australia is going absolutely nowhere near meeting its obligations. Now, it is not possible for a politician to, to not know the truth because scientists know the truth. Scientists tell the politicians. It's all in publications of all different levels. So if you want to say we are meeting our obligations under all these uh, treaties that have happened, um, you are not telling the truth. And again, that's political. A report card by the government's Australian Institute of Marine Science wasn't encouraging. Rising water temperatures are likely to cause more coral bleaching, producing irreversible damage to the reef. Scientists expect the coral may recover over the next five to 10 years, but only if another mass bleaching event doesn't occur during that time. That's unlikely given the current trajectory of climate change. In 2015, Australia Institute put the Carmichael mine's expected emissions over the next 30 years into perspective. It believes the annual carbon emissions of this single coal mine would be three times the average annual emissions from New Delhi, double those from Tokyo, six times that of Amsterdam, and 20% more than New York City if the mine produces 40 megatons per year. Adding more carbon dioxide from mines can potentially threaten thousands of animal species that rely on the reef, not to mention the $6.4 billion in tourism revenue and 64,000 full-time jobs the Great Barrier Reef provides to Australia. Tourism operator Lindsay Simpson is concerned about her livelihood. Her boat tours serve international tourists on a daily basis. If we add more mines to that, we are looking at a reef that's already under terrible threat. We're looking at 70,000 people earning their money from tourism who won't have anywhere to take anyone to look at. And I mean, I've had laughingly heard people say there's something called disaster tourism. She decided to investigate Adani by traveling to India on her own and ended up writing a book. He was going to bring jobs to everyone. So he was going to make it all good again and give lots of work. Now we all know 2% of the Australia's workforce work in mines. 
And if you think about that, it's an automated industry. If we look at how many of these people are going to get jobs, Adani promised in India he was going to give all these jobs to locals. He then imported workers from Orissa and all these other places. He did not give the locals jobs. He did for the first year, and there is evidence he's giving work now. That work is not going to be there. And if you look at in terms of long-term work, 1,300 workers is what he was talking about versus 70,000 in tourism. And those workers are only going to be fly in, fly out. The coal mine has also sparked the native title movement. Every mining project in this country, it tends to be out in um, remote country. And a lot of that country is traditional Aboriginal country. And under Australian law, um, Aboriginal people from those areas can claim what they call native title. And that's a form of guardianship over these lands. Now, no one has taken guardianship over that land, but there is an Aboriginal group there that wants to do that. And they can legitimately apply to the courts to do that. As a leader of the Wangan and Jagalingu native people who own this land, Adrian Baragaba took Adani to court. According to him, the Carmichael coal mine can harm around 30,000 hectares of his community's traditional lands. Eventually, the court ruled in favor of Adani Australia, who are now seeking $600,000 in court costs, which would bankrupt Baragaba. Adrian and his clan have now been barred from entering their own lands. This always was Aboriginal land. This always was First Nations sovereign land because of our culture and how we maintain our culture. And we're not going anywhere. It's always going to be Aboriginal land. It's always going to be our land. And if they, can, if, they want, if they want to come out here and try to move us and move our sacred site, then uh, they will be criticised. This country will be scrutinised over their treatment of Aboriginal people. The Wanganjagalingu people will no longer stand for this bullying tactic from Adani or from any government in this country. But Adrian's resistance sparked a people's movement across Australia, the Stop Adani movement. They are over here pleading with our governments not to build new coal mines. We have a responsibility to them and to our children to have a safe future for them to live in. The opposition to Adani's Carmichael mine has sparked a grassroots environmental movement across Australia. A loose group of environmental activists, students, and common folk coming together to pressurize Adani to stop the mine. Some of them have gathered at Camp Binbi. It's called the Stop Adani Movement. We've been given exclusive access to the camp after much deliberation and background checks. <laughs> 23-year-old Amy Booth used to live in Victoria, but decided to join the Stop Adani movement in the Australian outback. People are going to be displaced by the climate crisis, so I felt that me working um, in the city, taking sort of doing business as usual, working nine to five, just isn't where I want to be right now. We have a moral obligation to, to act and to stop this mine and to stop other environmental problems going ahead. Um, so I'm, I'm willing to put my life on hold for the moment to do what I can to stop projects like this from going ahead because this isn't just about this particular area. Every project that is a fossil fuel project is adding to CO2 in the atmosphere and that affects the entire globe. Protesters like Amy believe that if built, Adani's Carmichael mine will add billions of tons of carbon pollution to our atmosphere. In that context, it is criminally irresponsible to be proposing the opening of new coal mines or new coal-fired power stations. And the Adani case is a particularly important one because that would not just be a significant coal mine in itself, 
it would potentially open up the whole Galilee Basin as a new coal province. And there are five or six other possible coal mines in the pipeline that would be more likely to go ahead if Adani started, because the infrastructure for getting the coal to port, uh, for managing water and energy and infrastructure would be there and that would reduce the start-up costs of other coal mines. And that's why Adani has become a really symbolic issue in Australia. These anti-coal activists are now taking a more hands-on position by physically blocking coal trains, mines and machines, a strategy now commonly known as a lockdown. On 22nd July 2019, protesters set up a blockade outside the Abbott Point port. About 20 members of the environmental group gathered outside the port entrance at 7 a.m. This footage was filmed by Amy as her co-protesters, 22-year-old Emily Starr and 20-year-old Matilda Hesselin, locked themselves to a concrete barrel. We wanted to start acting to show that we weren't gonna let we weren't gonna sit by and let this just happen. Um, so we locked on in terms of we had our arms clipped onto this um, little bar inside a barrel that was filled with cement, and then there was a PVC tube that our arms would go down and be clipped onto. They stopped the supply of coal for hours. That's when the Queensland police stepped in. As tension mounted, a French television crew filmed the action from the side. I was willing to be arrested, which I was, because a short-term inconvenience of being arrested and being given a fine is OK with me, because the long-term benefit of stopping this mine from going ahead will be amazing. Amy continued filming events that day. The journalists and activists are detained and charged with trespassing on the railway line. The French crew were later released after global condemnation grew but they've since been barred from filming anywhere close to the mine. They were embarrassed. They think that that was a mistake, what the officers did up there, and I know from the police commissioner down, that was why the, the charges were dropped. So it was some overzealous police, policing by those police officers are up, up there. Emily and Matilda are now <laughs> facing a court hearing at Bowen, uncertain if they'll be allowed back into Camp Binby. We're hoping that no curveballs will be thrown when we get in there, but it'll likely just be sort of... Well, we're hoping it'll be a fine with no, like, restitution order against us, but we're not sure what it will be, really. Magistrates can do whatever they like. After an hour, they come out of the court. I feel like he understood our passion as well, which I think was really important. I really liked hearing that. He did understand that. Even if he didn't necessarily agree with it. Yeah, yeah. I think that in Australia we have a huge problem and in many places around the world we have a huge problem where the political systems are broken and that's why we've come to do these kind of actions because we feel like these are the only sort of things that can put enough pressure on political systems to fundamentally change rather than just sort of put a Band-Aid on the issue. We're at a critical point in history. There's no doubt that in ecological terms, we're booked on the Titanic. We're heading for the iceberg, and there are still irresponsible people, both literally and metaphorically, throwing coal in the boilers as if they wanted to get there faster. Coal particulates pollution is estimated to shorten some one million lives annually worldwide. One study even estimates premature deaths arising from coal-related air pollution could be as high as 52,000 people worldwide. But with solar and wind power slowly creeping up, there's been positive change. 
Coal's use has been on the decline in Europe and the US amid cheaper alternatives. Adani Australia is promoting solar power as a means to bridge the gap between coal emissions and the global push towards renewable energy. Rugby Run, which has an initial capacity of 65 megawatts, is located near Moranbar. It's not a question of renewables or coal, it's renewables and coal. And so from our perspective, we've already, we've got under over 2,385 megawatts under, const under operation uh, in relation to solar. And we've got another 2,340 megawatts currently under construction of solar capacity. So in short, uh, you know, we've got uh, in excess of 4,700 megawatts of renewables capacity in our portfolio. That's a mixture of, of solar, principally solar, but we've also got hybrid in there as well, including wind. So we see that uh, moving forward, in order to meet the developing world's energy demand requirements, it's going to continue to require underpinning baseload coal-fired power generation, in addition to renewables through the likes of solar, wind, um, hydro and so forth. Many believe the solution to Australia's coal dependence has to come from within the political sphere. The Australian Greens run on four core values ecological sustainability, social justice, grassroots democracy, and peace and non-violence. We were just sitting in Parliament, and the best thing about that whole experience was that we could hear you more than we could hear them. <laughs> Which is frankly what Parliament should be about. It should be about the people's voice being heard. The Greens have a plan to phase out coal and create a jobs boom in the renewable energy export industry. <laughs> we have great economic potential in clean energy here in Queensland, in Australia, globally. We know that there's more jobs in renewables. We know that uh, renewable energy can do the job. We've now got the battery storage, the solar thermal, the ways of making clean energy at 24-7 and dispatchable. There is no reason to not go down that path and actually safeguard humanity. Australia's current bushfire season has taken 12 lives, destroyed millions of hectares of land, and wiped out nearly 500 million animals, with no signs of rains or temperatures subsiding. Stopping global warming will require coordinated policies by national, state, and local governments. And the development of climate-friendly energy policies that are backed by politicians and activists alike. Before time runs out and the irreversible effects of climate change impact the very existence of humankind. Brazil's Amazon rainforest is being devastated by fires. Many of the farmers think the Amazon shouldn't exist a battle between economic development and environmental concerns. It was planned, fostered, and executed by the Bolsonaro government. With thousands of miners invading the forests to hunt for gold. Nearly 10,000 square kilometers of the Amazon are destroyed in 2019 através da proposta do próprio presidente Bolsonaro de utilizar essa questão mineral como uma grande alavanca de desenvolvimento econômico. Displacing hundreds of indigenous communities, pushing them to the edge. A violência tem, tem recrudescido no âmbito dos indígenas por conta da disputa por recursos naturais. Cadê outras pessoas que falam que está protegendo a Amazônia? Então, como a gente sempre diz, as árvores têm uma vida igual nós também. CNA investigates why the lungs of the world are being lost. Sao Paulo, Brazil. 
By 3 p.m., the city is smothered by black clouds of smoke. Scientists eventually discover the cause. Fires raging in the far north of the country, thousands of miles away in the Amazon rainforest. Official figures show more than 87,000 Amazonian fires are recorded in Brazil in the first eight months of 2019. An increase of 76% from 2018. These fires destroyed 10,000 square kilometers of the Amazon in 2019. While the Brazilian government fails to act, the world responds with outrage. With criticism focused on newly elected far-right president Jair Bolsonaro, the hate we know today was not happened by chance. It was planned, fostered, and executed by the Bolsonaro government. This is the truth. After Bolsonaro's election, Brazil's environmental agencies had their budget slashed. His economic policies are focused on developing the economy inside the Amazon rainforest. A list of birds but Aldam's investigation unearthed a bigger problem. Lack of implementation of Brazil's forest laws. What has happened? The company looks to the fine. Uh, fine two or three million reais. If I use good lawyers, I can stay years and years and years without pay. Or is more expensive to pay at the same time you receive the fine, then roll and roll and roll again the fines. It's happened every time. From 1980 to 2019, penalties for cutting trees down in protected areas totaled 17 billion US dollars. Less than 4% of these fines were collected. Corruption and the inability to collect fines have encouraged more violators to set up shop inside the Amazon, with hundreds of thousands of dollars to be made. There's a lot of people working with it. There's the people from illegal logging, there's the people from agribusiness, there's the people linked to illegal gold mining, for example, there's the people practicing wildlife traffic. There's a lot of people working with this chain of crimes in the Amazon. The deforestation is one of them. The cleared land is used to produce beef and agri-products, a large portion of which is exported to parts of Asia. People need to understand that we are all responsible for this. So even people far away in Pakistan, in China, in Australia, are also hel helping with the environment problems in the Amazon because they are consumers. They're helping to consume products that are coming from this region. Worldwide, forests still cover about 30% of the planet, but they're disappearing at an alarming rate. Between 1990 and 2016, the world lost 1.3 million square kilometers of forest, according to the World Bank. That's an area larger than South Africa. A floresta, além de uma produção de água, é como se fosse um oceano verde. Ela é um grande ar condicionado do planeta. Ela retira CO2 da atmosfera, estoca nas, na, nas árvores e, com isso, mitiga a mudança do clima, resfria a região. Se nós quisermos deixar para as próximas gerações um planeta minimamente habitável, nós precisamos manter a maior cobertura florestal tropical possível. We arrive in the state of Para to investigate the effects of the fires in northern Brazil. Burnt down jungles now resemble a war zone. Erika Berenga 
is an environmental scientist who's lived in the Amazon for the last 10 years, studying the destructive force of the fires here. Then what we do, we have a um, sort of tube that we put on the ground, a mesh tube, which is 30 centimeters and on the ground. And the roots grow inside the tube. So every three months, we get the tube off the ground, put the soil in a sheet, and then we hand pick all the roots for one hour. And then we put the soil back in the tube, the mesh tube back in the soil, and then it's gonna stay for another three months. So we can see in those three months how many roots are produced, how many roots grow in there. And then we can estimate how much of the carbon it's being allocated to the roots. Erica takes us for a walk inside a protected area to show us the impact of fires on the Amazon. So this is one of the main differences that you're gonna see between a burned forest and an unburned forest. You can see that we're not seeing many trees, many big, thick trees that we associate with the Amazon. Just all very thin, fast-growing species. The Amazon rainforest has 410 billion trees in this region alone, with a total of 76 billion tons of carbon stored in them. If we were to deforest the whole of the Amazon basin that comprises nine countries, all the emissions that would arise from this forestation would be equivalent of 100 years of the US fossil fuel emissions. That's how much carbon the Amazon stores. So it's a vital component to fight climate change. By keeping the forest standing, we are locking all this carbon in the forest and not putting back into the atmosphere. The study shows that take over 100 years to recover the carbon stocks that are present in this forest. And we still don't know how long it's gonna take for the biodiversity to recover. Animals are being affected too. It's believed that there are about 3 million different species of plant and animal life in the Amazon. In the Amazon, it's estimated that there is 16,000 species of tree. Just in the Brazilian part of the Amazon, which is 60% of the whole Amazon, we estimate to be 11,000 species. Unfortunately, I think that within my lifetime, if there's no political will, if we don't take strong positions, the Amazon is going to be gone. But President Bolsonaro wants to abolish protection for indigenous lands. His calls have been echoed by miners who've put self-preservation ahead of environmental conservation. After the break, we meet these miners who have invaded the Amazon in search of gold. Brazil is one of the biggest gold producers in the world. With output reported at 81 million kilograms in 2018. But there is a new gold rush in Brazil today. One fueled by soaring unemployment in regions inside the Amazon rainforest. They are invading public lands, log the trees, do some gold mining and, and damage in these areas, or do some fishing and hunting. As the planet loses the Amazon rainforest at a rapid pace, there are miners on the other end of the equation who are making increasing gains. Locally known as Garimperos, their rising incomes develop cities like Peixoto de Acevedo. Located in Meto Grosso State, they are gold-producing hubs for Brazil's lucrative gold industry. Today, miners have become more organized, creating cooperatives to hunt for gold collectively. One such cooperative is Copadive, that was founded in 2008 by former Sao Paulo banker Gilson Camboy. He takes us for a tour of the Copajive gold mines that are under his supervision. Hoje a gente tem um total de superamos 
5.500 cooperados ativos e estamos com aproximadamente assim, umas 130 frentes de lavras é, em atividade. E aí tem as que estão em, em fase de finalização de atividade, quanto as que estão tá iniciando atividade. Mas... Such gold mines are legal as part of the Brazilian government strategy to monetize the Amazon. But drone images reveal the damage to the environment. This was once a lush green forest with flora and fauna spread all across the landscape. It's been replaced by energy guzzling machines. Copa Jive alone has deforested 3,000 square kilometers of Amazon rainforest since 2008. Gold mining in the Amazon rainforest is attractive for the high yield of gold. On average, the concentration of gold is 0.5 grams for every one ton of soil. Inside the Amazon, the yield is much higher. The volume of gold is relative because we have 10 operators in this area. E o volume de ouro, cada pista tem um determinado percentual de produção, um volume produzido, entendeu? Porque às vezes ela pode estar saindo, às vezes ela pode estar tendo uma produção de é, 70, 80, 100 gramas por dia, ou pode às vezes ser mais ou menos. Gold is found underground after topsoil is removed. Once a 10-meter ditch is ready, the miners at Copadive, villagers from rural Brazil, get to work. A hydraulic machine is parked near the edge of this vast mining pit that's been carved into the rainforest's reddish brown earth. Hundreds of gallons of mud sludge produced by the miners is passed over carpets with the hope that gold flakes stick to it. The carpet is then washed into drums and the mud is taken to the final process. After extensive panning, mercury is used to extract gold from the mud through a process called amalgamation. Assim, a gente já tirou aqui em torno de 90% do mercúrio, a gente tirou aqui. Vai ficar aqui uns 10%, esses 10% a gente vai tirar quando fazer a fundição dele. Aí ele vai ficar, ele vai ficar, ele tá dessa cor aqui. Ele tá prata, ele tá da cor do mercúrio. É. A gente vai tirar aqui. Olha como que ele fica. The crew at Copajive work without protective equipment or procedures to help them discard the mercury safely. The amalgam of mercury and gold goes through the final process. Essa é a finalidade. A gente está colocando esse papel aqui, que é a hora que a gente for queimar o, 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 azul, o ouro, ele não grudar no fundo da cuia, que ele praticamente ele vai meio que derreter. Então a gente vai pôr aqui, entendeu? Esse papel... Ah. 
The heat applied evaporates the mercury, and gold is left in the pan. Kopajive mined 400 grams of gold today. This is distributed equally amongst everyone at the mine. It will sell for 500 US dollars. In the poor countryside, that's a fortune for a day's hard labor. Na parte, é, na parte que que tange a questão de a questão social, a gente tem um, um auxílio aos cooperados em questão assim às vezes numa eventualidade cadeira de roda, muleta, cesta básica, medicamentos, né? Já no caso quando a gente vai para a questão financeira, aí a gente tem a questão dele ter essa oportunidade de estar trabalhando numa área legalizada, onde ele consegue vender a sua produção com a devida nota fiscal, requerer a devida nota fiscal nos, nos trâmites legais, o, ter os seus impostos devidamente recolhidos, devidamente quitados e ele tendo ali, no caso, uma origem lista para a receita que ele vem obtendo e assim ele tem a justificativa dos seus, seus bens. The raw gold is sold to shops in the city, who process it into gold bars. The final product is exported to countries across Asia, the Middle East and America, earning billions of dollars in revenue for the government. Mines like Copajive are legal, and all part of President Bolsonaro's master plan to monetize the Amazon. Mineração legal, ela passa por todos os regulamentos e as legislações que envolvem as autorizações, inclusive ambientais, para que ela possa operar. Obviamente que tendo ela todas essas licenças, ela tem um mapa, ela tem uma bússola de como fazer isso de forma sustentável, de forma também que gere emprego e renda, riqueza para o país, sem prejudicar a natureza ou o meio ambiente. But what about the Amazon? On the ground, the damage done by legal mines is irreversible. Os peixes ficam mais rareados, a floresta é, é, perde seus animais, os barulhos hein, afugentam as caças, né? os, os, o, o, os peixes também somem porque é solo revirado. Então o impacto faz com que é, 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 o modo de vida dessas populações precise também ser alterado. By law. Copa Jive is supposed to restore the forests once the mine is closed. So Gilson takes us to a restored part of the mine. He's turned one area into a fish farm, while planting trees in another. É, a diferença não é que a rapidez de restauração não é compatível com a rapidez da, da exploração. Acontece que a gente está mexendo com um ser vivo e ele tem a sua necessidade, a sua, a sua carência natural, vamos dizer assim. Então você ab abre uma área, faz o nivelamento, recompõe o material orgânico e faz o plantio dela, ela vai levar um tempo para poder voltar ao que era, porque é o crescimento, a questão da, da, dela florir, dela gerar novas sementes, dessas sementes cair no solo, voltar de novo as novas as, essas que que nasceram posteriormente do das que foram plantadas. Então assim, o prazo dela no caso da, da natureza em si, porque daí no caso já é uma coisa que depende de, de, demanda da natureza, é que é um pouco mais lento o processo. As greed takes over concern for the environment. Many miners are going for the big bucks by starting their own mines, deep inside protected territories, away from the authorities. After the break, we dig deep into illegal mining and meet the people whose lands have been invaded in the protected forests of Brazil. Brazil's Amazon rainforest is one of the planet's best defenses against climate change. It absorbs billions of tons of carbon dioxide. But deforestation for logging, mining, and for farming crops and livestock 
has devastated it. In the last 10 years, the rainforest has lost an area the size of 8.4 million soccer fields. But the mining companies want to use indigenous lands to expand operations and make more profits. They're pushing for a change in Brazilian law, allowing firms to mine inside protected lands and indigenous reserves across the nation. Sem dúvida nenhuma, o aumento de legalização no setor não só vai diminuir a atividade legal na minha análise, como também vai diminuir o prejuízo ao meio ambiente do que causa essa inércia, essa deficiência de se analisar os processos que envolvem esses pedidos de licença. Através da proposta do próprio presidente Bolsonaro de utilizar essa questão mineral como uma grande alavanca de desenvolvimento econômico, Despite having protected status, indigenous territories are already facing an invasion. In Pará state alone, Brazilian authorities estimate that 30 metric tons of illegal gold, worth about 1.1 billion US dollars, has been excavated. That's six times more than the legal amount of gold traded in Brazil. Mais desmatamento, infelizmente. Se assim, enxerga a Amazônia muito como se enxergava 20 anos atrás, onde a floresta precisa ser removida para poder dar lugar a atividades produtivas. This mining boom could lead to the extinction of indigenous communities that have weathered centuries of calamities in Brazil's rainforest. Roughly 900,000 indigenous people live in Brazil less than 0.5% of the population. They belong to 400 tribes and speak more than 270 languages. One such tribe facing illegal mining in their protected areas are the Munduruku. We traveled 16 hours to the city of Bubure, Juarez is the chief of the Munduruku tribe. He leads nearly 14,000 members who have splintered into dozens of small villages, scattered across a territory slightly larger than 3,360 soccer fields. They've lived here for thousands of years. A floresta ela ensina, ensina a gente a usar cultura. A floresta ela ensina nós a segurar nossa língua, falar nossa língua. A floresta ensina a nós a usar o nosso costume, ensina a gente a conhecer o lugar sagrado. Né? Então, a floresta faz tudo para a gente. Né? A floresta ensina a gente a sonhar, sonhar bem, não que nem os governos sonham, com aquela riqueza. That's why Juarez has to create borders or more commonly known as demarcations, to identify his tribe's indigenous lands. Motivated by the surging international price of gold, miners choose to prospect for gold in protected reserves to evade taxes. It's estimated that nearly 50,000 illegal miners are working inside Para State alone. Por aí na região você não vê um garapé mais um garapé nativo mais só destruído só destruído já só com 
barranco de garimpo velho. O garimpo funciona assim. Ela não tem fim. Ela vai embora. E se tiver pintando ouro na, na região, ali eles vão explorando tudo. Os garapé que tiver, eles vão explorando. E vão, o que tiver, eles vão tirando. É aqui o limite do território, né? A gente colocou essas duas placas aqui, tanto essa placa aqui é igual do governo e essa nossa placa que é tradicional, né? É por isso que a gente faz o limite para poder a gente estar tá fiscalizando ela. Né? A gente sabe que tem muito madeireiro, tem muito palmiteiro que está invadindo a terra, né? Então é por isso que a gente tem que estar tá com o com, com limite também limpo. Permanently evicting indigenous people from their land is forbidden under Article 231 of Brazil's Constitution. But the Bolsonaro government is planning to build dams and infrastructure in the Tapajos River Basin to boost the economy. Armed with machetes, Juarez and his crew ensure the conservation of 178,000 hectares of Amazon rainforest. Hoje a gente está recebendo uma ameaça muito grande né, do governo. Hoje, em dia, hoje, agora, a gente está sabendo que tem muito especial que estão querendo legalizar o garimpo dentro da terra indígena. Né? A gente sabe que isso vai prejudicar a natureza, vai prejudicar nós, né? porque ela traz, traz um, um série de problemas. Né? Juarez takes us to one such illegal mining site, an hour's boat ride on the Tapajos River. As we arrive, we spot a mining transport truck. We tread carefully, as most miners are armed and do not like visitors. Miners in protected areas such as this excavate land deep inside the forests, away from the authorities, keeping clear of any inspections. Que a gente tem que é andar preparado, né, para a mostrar que a gente é uma liderança e está na frente de uma comunidade e para isso a gente tem que estar tá andando prepara preparado para todas as pessoas conhecer a gente que nós somos uma liderança. As we reach an abandoned mining pit, the extent of the devastation can only be gauged from high above. Kilometers of protected Amazon rainforest are now mere ditches. A gente está no garimpo do diamante. É aqui que eles começam. Começa não, começaram. Só que eles começaram descendo, foram até na boca e eles voltaram de novo. A mineração é minerador e também a legalização de garimpo. E aí fica muito pior, mais do que isso aqui ainda, né? Esse aqui é uma empresa pequena, está fazendo isso, imagina, entra uma empresa grande, né? E aí, é, é, e que a gente se pergunta, e o nosso futuro geração, eles vão viver de quê daqui a um tempo? Eu, pelo menos, que eu sou uma pessoa que, eu defendo muito a floresta, porque eu, eu sei isso o que significa a floresta para nós, para todo mundo, não é só para os indígenas. A gente sabe que We don't venture too far. We've been warned that the illegal miners may open fire. Five tribal leaders have already lost their lives in this battle. But with little enforcement of the law, the destruction continues. Os mundurucus estão sendo constantemente afetados. Eles têm sido enxovalhados das regiões. 
que eles ocupam. Né? É um processo que vem do continente, que vai esmagando eles em direção ao curso do rio Tapajós. Né? É uma terra indígena compreendida entre rios. Então, a mineração ilegal ela vem empurrando os indígenas e esgotando os recursos hídricos, os recursos é, naturais, né? contaminando águas e causando desordem. A map published by an NGO shows illegal mining sites in 37 indigenous territories. In total, nearly 2,300 illegal mining sites with sophisticated infrastructure have been found in protected areas. Juarez fears for his life and his community. Currently in Brazil, mining on indigenous territories is totally prohibited. The Amazon contains about 20% of the world's total volume of river water. More than 80% of the world's food has its origins in this rainforest. Apart from tearing down native forests, miners have also started digging for gold in the rivers, contaminating these waterways with mercury. We have reports on fish, dolphins, and indigenous tribes hardly contaminated by mercury. The humidity launched by the forest runs in the atmosphere and drops like rain all over Brazil, Argentina, South America, always connected. Dredging for gold disrupts rivers. Toxic pollutants seep into plants, animals, and people. Um ano passado morreu muito peixe por causa que o rio não encheu e aí o peixe ficaram sem alimentar. Eu acho que é, eles tinham tinha que olhar mais para nossa sobrevivência também, né? Porque a gente não é que nem esse pessoal que está morando na cidade e compra o que já está pronto, né? Então nós pescamos para poder se alimentar. Né? E o, os pessoal da cidade não, vai em supermercado, eles já vão comprando o que já está pronto, né? E nós é mais difícil. O nosso mercado é o Tapajós, é o rio, né? E a floresta, da onde a gente tira mais alimentação. Juarez and his community can no longer fish in the river. They have to hunt for food on land. Researchers found 92% of all hair and fish samples collected here had high levels of mercury, resulting in abnormalities in the central nervous system of infants. So Juarez has decided to take things into his own hands. After the break, we follow the Munduruku as they plan to invade Brazil's Congress to pressure politicians to take action. Pelas invasão de, de exploração de madeira né, e garimpo, garimpo também. E aí quem está sofrendo com isso somos nós. Então a gente quer que ele responda a nossa pergunta. Brazil's president Jair Bolsonaro plans to reduce indigenous territories in the Amazon rainforest. The tribes are being sacrificed to help boost the economy, to create jobs. The mining sector is encroaching into the rainforest, and the hunt for gold has begun. In 2018, Brazil's gold exports increased 150%, on an output of 95 tons. With demand rising, miners are pushing deeper inside protected forests, radically changing the landscape forever. This is why indigenous tribes have decided to invade the federal capital, Brasilia. Alessandra Korab, a Munduruku indigenous activist, is leading the charge. Alessandra has arrived in Brasilia, the country's capital, to meet her Munduruku clan.
A local school has been turned into a makeshift camp. These 50 Munduruku tribals plan to visit Brazil's Congress to meet politicians and demand that their lands, protected under Brazil law, be left alone. Porque a gente vem da aldeia, a gente vem de Vadeira, lá pro porto da estrada, a gente pega o carro para Taituba, para a cidade de Taituba, de lá a gente pega um ônibus para vir para cá. É por isso que a gente a gente vem aqui correndo o risco de da nossa vida também. A gente está contando sentar com defens, defensor público para elas invasão de de exploração de madeira, né, garimpo também. E aí quem está sofrendo com isso somos nós. According to Brazil's National Institute for Space Research, in 2018 alone, five square kilometers of indigenous Munduruku land was deforested. In 2019, the tree massacre increased to 15 square kilometers. Alessandra believes illegal miners have the backing of politicians. Como a gente está em guerra, né? Não vou pintar aqui, né? E esse aqui é quando antigamente as mulheres, né? Se pintava, né? Quando tinha um ritual assim, quando os, os homens iam caçar, ou então ia para guerra, né? Next day, the tribe prepares for battle. They believe Bolsonaro's rhetoric has encouraged the advance of the miners deeper into indigenous territory. Não tem como chamar atenção. O único chamar atenção é vindo para esse lugar, né? Falar dos nossos problemas, falar que eles também têm que resolver, né? The Munduruku are on their way to Congress to block a bill that will allow mining companies to operate inside indigenous lands legally. It's a key campaign promise of President Bolsonaro. If approved, indigenous tribes and their way of life may be gone forever. An economic recession in Brazil has driven large numbers of unemployed villagers into the jungle to hunt for gold. And the price is being paid by indigenous people. The Munduruku arrive at Brazil's Congress, the main legislative body of the country. This movement is helped by the country's only indigenous congresswoman, Joinha Wapichana. She's only the second indigenous woman to have ever been elected to Congress. Em primeiro lugar, é o dever do Estado brasileiro fazer a proteção dos povos indígenas, dos seus direitos e das terras, principalmente. Então, nessa é uma obrigação constitucional. A terra indígena é um patrimônio, um bem comum e bem coletivo dos povos indígenas. Nesse sentido, então, não estou é, confiante, não confio nesse governo e porque ele é um governo que persegue, ele odeia os povos indígenas, pelo que eu estou vendo, e não tem feito nada para fazer a segurança dos povos indígenas. Of the more than 594 Congress representatives, only three show up. The others celebrate a football team's participation in a local league. In a separate chamber, Alessandra makes an impassioned plea for the rights of the Munduruku. A nossa 
luta é isso. A nossa luta, que vem de Santarém, do Xingu, do Alto Tapajós, do Mar de Tapajós, era para ver as pessoas estar tá aqui e dizer, ó, oh, os índios estão ali, com, é, os índios estão lá. Eles sintam sentindo isso na pele. Eles sintam vendo a desgraça que está acontecendo. E dizer, não a mineração das terras indígenas, e sim demarcação das terras indígenas. Sem a demarcação, não existe o meio ambiente, não existe os animais, não existe o rio. Imagine nós, indígena que está ali, né? a ferrovia passando por cima, a hidrelétrica alagando as terras indígenas, secando, mas quer acabar com os povos indígenas, quer acabar com o rio Tapajós. As Brazil is polarized on the issue of mining in the Amazon, other industries are coming up with solutions. Loren started Paxa, a cattle ranching firm in June 2015. He helps Brazilian farmers with sustainable cattle farming. According to the Amazon Institute, some 12 million hectares of cattle field have been degraded in the Amazon region. To create new grazing land, vast expanses of the Amazon are cleared. To date, an estimated 70% of deforested Amazon has been converted into pasture land. But Paxa offers a solution. So here we use rotated grazing. Rotated grazing means that we have a production module that has several divisions. And the cattle will stay in one division for just a few days and then goes to the other one and then to the other one. And while uh, the cattle does all this uh, cycle, then the first one is resting. This allows, first, uh, the fact that the cattle always has access to the best part of the plant, only the leaves. Doing uh, efficient production, we don't need uh, any more to clear any more land. Many big corporations uh, over the world have made commitments to remove deforestation from the supply chains. From 2010 to 2017, Brazil's beef exports climbed 25% to 1.5 million tons, with Hong Kong importing the most. To accommodate global beef demand, cattle ranchers are driving their herds deeper into the Amazon rainforest. But since operations began in Alta Floresta, Paxa has restored 10,000 hectares of pasture land. It now runs 20 farms that sustainably manage cattle, 34,000 head in 2017 alone. For Laurent, reinventing cattle feed was another necessity of the hour. Methane emitted by livestock accounts for about 5.5% of worldwide greenhouse gases greenhouse gases that increase global temperatures. And when they have this poor diet, only based on pasture and a low quality pasture, then they have a lot of production of methane. When we do the reform of the pastures, and then we enter with this supplement, uh, we change the diet of the, the animals. So we have two benefits. One is to reduce by more or less 40% the amount of methane that is emitted by the animals. So when you consider the methane of the animals and also the carbon from the soil, all together we reduce the emissions by 90%. Today, the deforestation in the Amazon claims an area the size of two football fields a minute. If consumption patterns don't change, 50% of the Amazon may vanish by 2030, destroying one of the world's largest carbon sinks. Protecting existing rainforests and aggressively planting new ones may be the only way forward, and perhaps one of the last few ways to help save this planet and all who call it home.
Pakistan's Himalayan glaciers are melting at the fastest rate in human history. Nearly 36% of its ice sheet will be gone by 2100. So ye aapko jahan hum khade hain ye to nazar nahi aayegi mujhe lagta hai. Wo pani jitna jama shuda pani hai wo ek saath nikalta hai. In a battle for water in Kashmir, a nuclear flashpoint between India and Pakistan. ये बड़ा एक रेयर कमोडिटी होगी बढ़ती आबादी और इसी पर जो है ना मुल्क कल जंगे लड़ेंगे और एक दूसरे को बर्बाद करेंगे इम्पैक्टिंग द वाटर नीड्स ऑफ मोर देन टू बिलियन पीपल इन साउथ एशिया विद राइजिंग हीट वेव्स इन मेगा सिटीज इंक्रीसिंग वाटर कंसम्पशन कम्युनिटीज आर फाइटिंग ओवर ड्विंडलिंग सप्लाई और इसमें गवर्नमेंट सब मिली हुई I don't think many Pakistanis know how bad it is. Could an ambitious tree planting drive save the melting glaciers? So we want to restore 10 lakh hectares in Pakistan. Karachi, Pakistan's largest city with a population of 20 million. The economic nerve center of the country is brought to a standstill. A severe heat wave strikes the southern port city in June 2015, with temperatures as high as 49 degrees Celsius. The blazing sun causes total mayhem. Unaware and unprepared, more than 2,000 people across Karachi perish from dehydration and heat stroke. Hospitals are ill-equipped to deal with such a calamity. The Abbasi Shaheed Hospital mortuary runs out of space. As a result, mass graves are dug to dispose of the bodies. Memories of 2015 have come back to haunt Karachi today. In 2019, the heat wave has returned with average daytime temperatures hitting 49 degrees. The Sindh government declares a citywide emergency. We head out to the Abbasi Shaheed Hospital's heat stroke unit. To our surprise, there are no heat stroke patients today. The whole of said and I, the logo go mentally torpid prepared name. Subsame to ye bati. Jiski vaja say number of patients bohot ziada report to it or I be the or smay expiries be in the upke last 2015 to about 16 and 17 in maybe gray joint time to time each is a hit wave eye. मगर उसमें क्योंकि अवेयरनेस प्रोग्राम अवेयरनेस इतनी हो गई थी जिसमें लोगों ने इससे बचाव के तहत जो है इस हीट स्ट्रोक के पेशेंट का फ्लो रिपोर्ट कम हुआ था हुआ होगा लामाला आए हुए होंगे मगर वो नंबर ऑफ पेशेंट नहीं थे जिस तरह से उस वक्त आए थे Karachi government officials are also better prepared Mobile units equipped with water sprays are deployed strategically during the hotter hours of the day. Despite the 49 degree temperature today, no casualties are reported.
This is the new normal in Karachi. An international climate report puts Pakistan at number six on the list of top 10 countries most affected by climate change. And in mega cities like Karachi, lack of trees, miles of asphalt roads, and tall buildings have increased heat absorption. Making matters worse, is an unchecked growing population in poorly planned yet densely populated settlements. Karachi um, is a spectacular example of population explosion. It was a small coastal city which became the capital city and it is now the largest city. So population, you have more people, you need more water, you have more shops and factories, you need more. Also, mismanagement. Karachi did not manage to protect its water courses. With rising temperatures, the massive population of Karachi consumes more water. Karachi needs 1.1 billion gallons daily to supply water to roughly 20 million residents. But the Water Board, the city's water distributor, is only able to provide 550 million gallons per day. Muhammad Arif is a resident of Karangi. His tap runs dry. Then we don't have water. Then we know that the old line is gone. We are saying that our old line is gone. We are saying that our old line is gone. We are saying that our old line is gone. आप इसको हमारी लाइन ना रिपेयर कर देंगे या इसको दूसरी डलवा दें तो वाटर बोर्ड हमें जवाब देता है कि हमारे पास इसके लिए फंड नहीं है। Broken water distribution lines multiply the problem for Karachiites. At 2 a.m., Arif arrives at the main distribution pipeline of the government, a hundred meters from his home. He plans to divert water to his home with the aid of hoses and a handheld motor. अब ये इससे आगे मजीद नहीं जा सकती तो यहाँ end कर कर motor को end कर कर अपने घर पे पानी पानी पहुँचाया जा रहा है एक motor घर पे चल रही होगी ये motor चल रही है ना यही motor एक घर पर भी चल रही होगी जो इसको खींच रही है मतलब दो दो तीन तीन motor हमें लगाने के बावजूद घर पे कहीं जाके हमें पानी मिलता है और आपके सामने � there are nearly a million people in this neighborhood of Karangi alone. And everyone's thirsty. Maximum. <laughs> So what does the water board, Karachi's water distributor, have to say? Basically, it's a transmission problem. Karachi's water demand is about 1,200 million gallons per day. There's naturally evaporation, leakages, pilferage in it. So when we minus it, we have to give it 400-400 MDT water. So we have to understand that it's about one-third water that we have available and the remaining water that we have available. The Karachi Water and Sewerage Board tries to maintain it and tries to maintain it. As water becomes rare and difficult to access, a black market is thriving. According to the Karachi Water and Sewerage Board, 42% of water is lost in distribution before reaching consumers. So where does all this water go? We go in search of Karachi's water thieves for an answer to this question. After much deliberation, we finally convince a water thief to take us to his theft point. We film the process secretly. So our time is limited. So we are going to just interview one time. एक इंटरव्यू हो जाए जहाँ पे पानी जो है वो डिस्ट्रीब्यूट हो रहा है ठीक है चलें आ जाएं फरार गोइंग एंड वी गोइंग टू फिल्म दिस
इधर जाना है The water thief takes us to a congested slum. In the meantime, the mastermind arrives to explain how it works. कौन कनेक्शन दे रहा है जमीन बोर किया ये बोर हुआ है क्या अच्छा ये बोर हुआ है ये पानी बोरिंग का है बोरिंग का पानी है ठीक है ये बोरिंग का पानी जब मोटरों से निकाला जमीन की जमीन के थ्रू लाइन जा रही नदी में नदी में नदी में के पास इनके टैंक बने हुए पानी के होलसेलर जो बैठे हुए हैं ठीक है वो वहां से फिर इंडस्ट्री को दे रहे पानी ठीक है तो ये ये तो फिर तो ये तो नॉर्मल है ना फिर ये तो नॉर्मल कर रहे हैं लेकिन इसकी आड़ में ये इलाके के पानी को भी चोरी कर रहे हैं तो जो पानी नहीं मैं वही कह रहा हूँ ना कि जो पानी हुकूमत यहाँ भेज रही है वो यहाँ से फिर वहाँ जा रहा है वो भी हो रहा है बोर के बोर तो हो रहा है ना बोर भी हो रहा है बोर के साथ साथ गवर्नमेंट की लाइनों को जो इलाके में पानी आ रहा है उसको भी चोरी करके उस, उसी पानी से मिक्स करके आगे दे रहे हैं तो फिर ये जो इलाका इधर है इधर पानी है इधर पानी है इतना नहीं है जितना होना ठीक है होना चाहिए था क्योंकि ये पानी उधर निकल गया अच्छा सिर्फ इतनी सी कहानी है टोटल ये कहानी है पानी उधर ठीक है समझ गया इलाके को आ रहा है कितने परसेंट तीस परसेंट पच्चीस परसेंट इलाके पे आ रहा है और सत्तर फीसद वहाँ जा रहा है और उससे फिर सब मिले सब मिले हुए और वो जो पानी जब बिकता है इंडस्ट्री को तो आप पैसे बन जाते हैं सिंपल है ये तो कोई पानी माफिया होगी वो बैठी हुई हाँ हाँ वो बना रही है और इसका कोई रेंट मिल जाता है या इसका क्या मिल जाता है इसका कितना एक रेंट मिल जाता है पर मंथ है या पर मंथ ठीक है और इसमें गवर्नमेंट सब मिली हुई है एक काम हो रहा है कैसे हो रहा है खाना माना सबको देते हैं वो लोग कैसे जो पानी वाले जो ले रहे हैं सबसे तो अच्छा ये कहाँ कहाँ तक कट जाता है वाटर बोर्ड जाता है पुलिस को जाता है किसी को सारे डिपार्टमेंट्स को जाता है अच्छा और अगर चेयरमैन वगैरह सब He takes us to where he steals the water from. Water that he then sells at exorbitant rates, while government officials get their cut. जब भी demand supply के अंदर फर्क आता है, तो ऐसी चीजें होती हैं। चाहे वो गंदम में हो, sugar में हो, rice में हो, किसी भी चीज़ में, या community में, तो होता ये है कि आज कराची में पानी पूरा हो जाएगा, ये सब चीजें खत्म हो जाएंगी। और मैं इस बात से कतई नज़र बिल्कुल इसको मैं डिनाई नहीं करूंगा कि काली भेड़े और ये जो करप्ट लोग होते हैं ये हर डिपार्टमेंट में होते हैं थेफ्ट करप्शन एंड डिसरिपेयर हैम्पर वाटर एक्सेस फॉर मिलियंस इन पाकिस्तान लार्जेस्ट सिटी इट कॉस्ट मिलियंस ऑफ डॉलर इन लॉसेज टू द नेशनल एक्सचेकर दिस स्टोल इन वाटर इज डाइवर्टेड फ्रॉम द पुअर टू द रिच यू कैन पे मोर A short-term solution the city developed for its water needs were water tankers that now control much of Karachi's water distribution. More than 10,000 tankers operate in the city under government control, making an estimated 50,000 delivery trips to consumers across Karachi each day. But with few checks and balances, excessive bribes kick in when heat waves hit Karachi. Allowing tanker drivers to jack up rates as they will. Delivery of a 1,000-gallon water tanker now costs between 12 and 18 dollars per trip. This is a steep price, especially for larger, poorer families, who spend a third of their income on stolen water. A global study projects that nearly 5 billion people will live in water stress regions by 2050. While the United Nations estimates that water shortages can displace hundreds of millions of people as early as 2030. Water is a massive political issue in Karachi and corruption is in the middle of it all. With one political party depriving the water needs of another party's constituency. इट इज़ अट रियलिटी एक डिज़ास्टर मैं देख रहा हूँ कराची में पानी का शदीद बहरान और इस बहरान की वजह से होने वाले फसादात को देख रहा हूँ मैं 
कराची के लोगों को जिसमें तमाम एथनिक बैकग्राउंड वाले हैं लोग तमाम पॉलिटिकल एफिलिएशन वाले लोग हैं लेकिन इट्स एक्नॉमिक हब मैं आने वाले दिनों में बड़ा भयानक चीज़ें देख रहा हूँ क्योंकि जब आप रिसोर्स की अनइक्वल डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन करेंगे किसी को मिल रहा है तो बहुत मिल रहा है पानी किसी को नहीं मिल रहा तो वो बूंद बूंद को तरस रहा है तो इस बुनियाद के ऊपर एक फसाद बर्पा होते हुए देख रहा हूँ एंड इट इज रियली अलार्मिंग While solving Karachi's water crisis seems like a distant pipe dream, the residents of Karachi are left with no option but to buy stolen water. After the break, we embed with the Karachi Water Task Force in their efforts to stop water theft. Karachi, Pakistan's largest city, has an epidemic. To capitalize on climate change-related water shortages, Karachi's black market for water is thriving. Millions of dollars worth of government water is being stolen and sold to people who can pay a premium. So the Karachi Water Board has stepped up their efforts. Chief Security Officer Tabish Raza heads the task force against water theft. Abhi hum log ja rahe hain ye jo Isakabad hai, Azizabad, Bangori idhar humne pehle bhi aaye tode the, lekin suna hai dobara start ho gaye. तो उनको दोबारा तोड़ने जा रहे हैं और इस वक्त हम उनको तोड़ेंगे और जो भी सामान होगा वो सब जब्त करेंगे क्योंकि वो क्योंकि मुखबरी के नेटवर्क भी चल रहा होते हैं इन्फॉर्म 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 करते हैं कि भाई ये इलाका अब दोबारा चल गया इन्फॉर्मेशन ये आई थी तो हम अब बगैर आपने किसी को पता क्योंकि मेरे स्टाफ को ही पता हम लोग कहाँ जा रहे हैं ठीक है हम तोड़े जा रहे हैं और कहीं ना कहीं बनते जाते हैं तो ये जो है ना चोर पुलिस वाला खेल है आप जितना भी तोड़ो क्राइम कम जरूर हो जाता है ख़त्म नहीं होता इसी तरह हमारा भी है कि हम तोड़ते हैं लेकिन वो पता नहीं इनको पानी के काम में इतना क्या इंटरेस्ट होता है कि हम तोड़ते हैं वो रिस्क लेकर दबा लगाते हैं एज सुन एज वी रीच द लोकेशन द थीव्स आर स्पॉटेड एंड द रेन बिगिनस अब देखो सूखी लग रही है ये लगे ये खड़ी है गेट खड़ी है खड़ा हुआ ये रोड है देखो बोर्ड में भी लगी है खड़ी है लाइन पे खड़ी है खड़े के लिए खड़ी है ये खड़ी है बोलने की तो अपना काम कर रहे हैं बोलेंगे क्या है मैं वहाँ पे नहीं बोलता है सही है तब कुछ भी बोलेंगे सारिया का ये निकालेंगे इसे बचान देना अब ये देखें ये देखें ये तोड़ चुके हैं और ये देखें ये ये चोरी है ये देखें कितना मजबूत करोड़ कर रहे हैं ये ये उठाओ लाइन लाइन तोड़ ये 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 निकालो वो मैं बोल द और वहाँ से फिर ये पानी इधर भरा इसमें भरते हैं इसमें भरते हैं और यहाँ से ये अब ये यह स्टोर कर लिया पानी मोटर चला के अब मोटर बंद कर दिया अब इन्होंने इस मोटर से पानी लोगों को टंकी बनाने शुरू कर दिया A water motor is confiscated in the raid. As Tabish explains, the kind of money changing hands in Karachi's illegal water industry. इस मैं बता रहा हूँ ये ये हजार रुपए डेढ़ हजार की बिकती है भाई आप जरा पूछे मेरे डालो ये कहते हैं हम ऊपर पहुंचा के देंगे पंद्रह सौ लेंगे अब अगर ये पचास सौ की सूजी रोजाना बढ़ ली पंद्रह सौ मल्टीप्लाई करें पचास से कितना हुआ एक सू की बात कर रहा हूँ चौबीस घंटे चलता है कार्ड वर्ड सब छपे हैं ये कार्ड है इनके हाँ अच्छा मतलब ये वो आप रोड से आ रहे होते हैं उनके लोग बैठे होते हैं किसी दुकान पर बैठा होता है यार एक मोबाइल मोड़ी है तो ये Tabish has received another tip-off from a neighboring town. 
a textile factory is stealing and reselling water. The illegal pump from the bore is taken out and confiscated. This is a daily routine for Tabish and his team. They arrest the perpetrators and destroy 10 pumps a day. But in a city of 20 million people and with limited resources, the Karachi Water Board can only play catch up with the thieves. And climate change will only worsen Karachi's water woes. Climate change will mean more floods, it will mean more droughts, it will mean uh, heat waves like the one we saw in Karachi. Two years ago, it will mean reduction in the quantity and reduction in the quality of water. Both are serious. There will be significant health impacts. Soaring temperatures in South Asia are reaching peak levels due to rising greenhouse gas emissions. The heat is melting the water wall of South Asia, the Himalayas, that supply water to the rest of the subcontinent. The glaciers in northern Pakistan, in the disputed region of Kashmir, are the biggest ice sheets outside the polar regions. These ice sheets are melting. We drive 15 hours from Islamabad to Gulmit, a village in northern Pakistan, to investigate its impact. According to a new study, 36% of the glaciers found in the region will be gone by 2100. Sitara Parveen is a glaciologist who has studied these ice sheets for a decade. This was once the area which had plenty of water from this glacier because the glacier was much higher. And even up to the level of these moraines, you can see here this moraine, it shows that the, the level was much higher. So the water was uh, recharging these uh, irrigation channels. The glaciers are very sensitive to climate. They act according to the temperature and the precipitation. When it's hot, it melts a lot. Since 1988, the snow line in northern Pakistan has receded by 1.1 kilometers. What scientists and glaciologists thought was impossible in 1,000 years has happened within 30. If global emissions stay at current levels, future generations may never see ice in South Asia. These glaciers are also important for these farmers who are living here, who depend on these agricultural for their livelihoods. Because you can see this, uh, that this is very uh, moisture deficit area, less rainfall in these plain areas where uh, this glacier, the people uh, practice agriculture. So it's not possible without the water from these glaciers. Nestled in the Karakoram Mountains, as high as 23,000 feet, village communities like these are vulnerable. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We welcome you today. We welcome you today. We welcome you. Lakes forming within the glaciers often burst, causing flash floods, destroying life and property downstream. Shaukad Ali, a local resident and tour guide, takes us to the Gulkan Glacier. Due to pollution, 
fine particles of black carbon are deposited onto white glaziers, speeding up the melting process. And this black, the GB, you will get very little black glaciers. You will get more than white glaciers. But in those black glaciers, there are 600 glaciers that are black. There is also a Hulkin glacier. You can see it. بلکل سنو یہ کورڈ ہے مٹی سے اور اس کی ایک ریزن یہ ہے کہ یہ جس جگہ سے اس کا بیس ہے وہاں سے یہ مٹی ساتھ لے کے آتا ہے پتھر لے کے آتا ہے آفٹر ایک تری آر ٹریک آور آئیس وی ارائیو ایت دی گلکن گلیزیا ون ایف دی لارجسٹ ان نورن پاکستان سٹریمز آف وارٹر رن ڈاؤن انٹو دی کریویسز کلیکٹنگ ایت دی باٹم آف دی گلیزیا As the sun blazes onto the ice sheet, Shaukat points out, this water collects into a massive lake within the glacier that can burst any time and flood the village downstream. First, here, what you are looking at, this is the whole ice that is melted from the side of the ice. This is one of the most important parts of the ice that has made its way to the ice. نیچے سے پھر وہ نیچے دریا تک پہنچ جاتا ہے تو اگر اس کے راستے میں پتھر آ جائیں جو یہ پتھر گر رہے ہیں وہ پانی جتنا جمع شدہ پانی ہے وہ ایک ساتھ نکلتا ہے In June 2019 a glacial lake formed in the neighboring Shispa glacier that forced the government to react Local officials hurriedly built a concrete wall to prevent the water from bursting the banks but they stood no chance in front of the savage wall of water that came hurtling down at the village. Tariq remembers that fateful day. The wall basically was made for the purpose of the remaining land, the land, the people, to save them, basically. So, in a few places, the wall was made for the land. The land was not enough. اب اس سے آگے میں آپ کو بعد میں دکھا بھی سکتا ہوں لوگوں کی کئی زمینیں چار چار چھے چھے کنال زمینیں کٹ کے بہت چکی ہیں اس سے اور انتظامیہ کی طرف سے ابھی تک کوئی اسسمنٹ تو ہو گئی ہے اس کے بعد کوئی کمپنسیشن کا جو لوگوں کا ڈیمانڈ ہے ان کا جو ڈیمانڈ مطالبہ ہے اس پہ بھی کوئی کاغذ ایون ایسی کے دفتر سے آگے موو بھی نہیں کیا کاغذ نے تاریک بلیوز مور دن تھرٹی ہومز پر واشت آوے And if proper planning was done, they could have been saved. Look, this is a very difficult task. When you go to the community, you are satisfied to be 100% of them. As many walls were made, Alhamdulillah, I am saying that 20% of your walls have not been damaged. 80% of your walls are now as it is, constant there. 20% of your 200 feet. 200 feet is nothing. It will be damaged. Our purpose was here. Tariq takes us to the Shispa Glacier. He believes it's the next disaster in the making. This black glacier is physically moving five to six meters a day downstream to the village due to rising temperatures. And local communities are concerned if it's going to destroy homes again. ابھی بھی چونکہ دس بارہ دن پہلے ہم لوگ آئے تھے یہاں پہ سی ٹورس کے ساتھ وہ یہاں پہ فاصلہ اتنا زیادہ تھا کہ ابھی مجھے اندازہ یہ ہو رہا کہ چار سے پانچ میٹر کم از کم یہ اس کی مومنٹ ہے تو اگلے ہفتے یا اگلے سنڈے کو یہ دس دن بعد آئیں گے تو یہ آپ کو جہاں ہم کھڑے ہیں یہ تو نظر نہیں آئی مجھے لگتا ہے اس کو بھی پیک کرے گا The region is expected to face mass water shortages in around 50 years when glaciers become too small. After the break, we take you to the highest militarized zone in the world, where India and Pakistan are battling a war on top of a glacier. Pakistan has been bestowed with five of the biggest rivers in the world. The mighty Indus, Jhelum, Chenab, Ravi, 
and Sutlej that have cascaded down the plains of the Punjab for hundreds of years. These rivers are formed by melting glaciers in the Karakoram and Himalayan ranges. One such glacier is nestled between India and Pakistan in the eastern Karakoram range in the Himalayas. It's called the Siachin Glacier and is claimed in full by both Pakistan and India. It's been disputed territory after the two countries split in 1947. The contended area is a sheet of ice nearly 1,000 square miles in total. Unable to settle the land dispute diplomatically, troops were amassed on top of the glacier by both countries. Pakistan and India have spent millions of dollars a month to keep troops posted here. At 6,700 meters, it is the highest militarized zone in the world. The dispute over land between India and Pakistan transcends downstream to the waters that continue to flow from India to Pakistan. After partition in 1947, India and Pakistan were unsure of how to share water. Hence, the Indus Water Treaty was signed in 1960 between then Indian Prime Minister Jawahar Lal Nehru and Pakistani President Ayub Khan in Karachi. Brokered by the World Bank, the treaty allowed both countries to use the water available in the Indus system of rivers. The two countries, because of historic problems and uh, animosity and hostility, could not agree on joint management. So it was considered that a second partition should take place. Pakistan got the rights to use the three western rivers, the Indus, Jhelum, and Chenab exclusively, while India won the rights to use the three eastern rivers, the Ravi, Sutlej, and Bias. But today, tensions between the nuclear neighbors over Kashmir is putting pressure on this water treaty. The Hindu nationalist BJP, led by Prime Minister Modi, has rattled things. Modi now wants to build dams to block the flow of water into Pakistan, making the Indus River a hotspot that might escalate into a nuclear war. I think the next fight would be on water, actually. The world is going to fight on a water. And we never realized Indus Water Treaty, when it was done in the 70s, that was the time that we could solve this problem. But India always more authoritative, never obey the rules, even if they are internationals. So this treaty remained, what would I say? It, it remained just in the books. Pakistan's semi-arid climate means more than 90% of harvests depend on irrigation. You're going to have Pakistanis receiving less water. So when you receive less water, you blame the supplier. So there is a potential uh, uh, source of conflict. And the Secretary General in his report, the UN Secretary General, made a specific reference to India and Pakistan and said that climate change is likely to put pressure on the Indus Water Treaty, which has served the two countries well for almost 60 years. Despite four full-blown wars, India and Pakistan have never had a water war. But the situation in the disputed region of Kashmir is escalating. A majority of Pakistan's rivers originate from Indian-administered Kashmir. And in August 2019, India did the unthinkable. India's dams released nearly 6 million litres of water per second into Pakistan without intimation. The Pakistani province of Punjab was flooded, drowning hundreds of acres of agricultural land. Islamabad reacted angrily. It claimed this unexpected release of water into the river Sutlej 
that flows from India to Pakistan was part of an attempt by New Delhi to flout the Indus Water Treaty. This was followed by the revocation of Article 370 in 2019 to eliminate the special status of Indian-administered Kashmir, an area claimed by Pakistan. World largest open air jail. So, this is a very important thing. We have to say that the people who are in the world are in the world. The people who are in the world are in the world. The people who are in the world are in the world. The people who are in the world are in the As geopolitical realities mix with a potential water war, the reaction in Pakistan administered Kashmir is intense. We travel to Pakistan-controlled Kashmir at the front line of this complex battle where tempers are reaching boiling point. Such rallies in Pakistan-administered Kashmir have become routine. Frequent protests are putting pressure on the Pakistani army to liberate Indian-administered Kashmir and secure the supply of water for mainland Pakistan as well. So, Modi has tested the case of Kashmir. What will Kashmir be in Kashmir? What will Kashmir be in Pakistan? What will Kashmir be in the region? What will Kashmir be in the world? So, it's a larger agenda. And I understand that from this agenda, it's a danger from this whole region, which is a danger from the human being, the danger from the human being, or the two of the world's civilization, the Indus and the Ganges. This is the case that the Lord has been able to fight and fight, so this will be the case of the war. और ये इतने में जो इसमें डेढ़ बिलियन लोग रहते हैं ये कहाँ जाएंगे? The government of Pakistan administered Kashmir fears that Prime Minister Modi may usurp the Indus Water Treaty and leave Pakistan in a drought-like situation. In a never-ending conflict between two nuclear-armed countries, more than 50,000 Kashmiris have lost their lives. Will the water dispute claim more? After the break, we look at Prime Minister Imran Khan's billion tree tsunami that's being built as the idea that could save the region. December 2019, New Delhi is in the grips of an intense smog. The air quality index reads as high as 1,000. The smog transcends the border over to parts of Pakistan. A blame game erupts between politicians on either side of the border. It never stopped its uh, kisan to, to burn the rice husk. It never stopped its people for the, or the bhatta mazdoor for a brick kilns. Next time, through our foreign ministry, for this Kashmir issue or for any bilateral talk, third agenda should be this smoke and all this pollution between India and Pakistan. And again, I'm saying, Pakistan has done a lot, India has not. NASA satellite data shows a heavy concentration of fires on the Indian side and far fewer on the Pakistani side of the border. 
The end result was a deadly smog and downgrading of air quality across the subcontinent, particularly in India. Cricket star turned Prime Minister Imran Khan's surprising response grabbed headlines. His party, the Pakistan Tariq e Insaf, spearheaded Billion Tree Tsunami in 2014 at a cost of $169 million. This was the Pakistani government's response to the challenge of global warming in South Asia. Pakistan has the lowest tree cover in the region, giving it more reason to reforest. A billion trees were planted from 2014 to 2018. But Prime Minister Khan isn't stopping here. He has vowed to plant 10 billion trees in the next five years of his government. 10 billion tree tsunami. But before that, it was actually a billion tree tsunami. Uh, it was started by the Prime Minister Imran Khan. And at that time, he was not a Prime Minister. And we had a one province government that was called KPK. Uh, this was the first green initiative that our country started in 73 years. It was one of the different and the finest uh, project that any government on provincial level started. So it was billion tree tsunami and it has made the marks on the, on the history and on the world. The plan is to increase the forest cover in the country and attract rains that will reduce rising temperatures. In total, Pakistan has restored 350,000 hectares of forest and degraded land to surpass its bond challenge commitment. Pakistan's Vision 2025 is aiming to work on better water management as well. Due to traditional farming techniques, two-thirds of irrigation water is lost through system leakages across the country. That's why farmers like Ashik Bangash have stepped in. A resident of Islamabad, Bangash decided to introduce drip irrigation into Pakistan's traditional farming system. To save the time and uh, water and uh, to give water to the plants up to the standard requirement. Nor less, nor excess. Ye uska ek basic wo hai ke aap agar open denge to pani zyada chala jata hai. Pani aur fertilizer ye dono aisi cheez hai jisne ye samaj liya. Bas wo kamyab ho gaya. Agar zyada diya, to bhi nuksan. Kam diya, to bhi nuksan. Pakistan is among the six countries that will be most affected by global warming and a rising population calls for measures to protect natural resources. In the last 10 years, the farmer ko government has been very facilitated. That is, if you have a crore of one crore, you have to pay 80 lakh government pay kar rahi hai, pure system. Pe. Drip irrigation, solar system and high shed. And 20 lakh farmer ko pay to pay. So the farmer also has a lot of time and the amount of water is very much more than the water reservoir. Twenty twenty-five has been marked as the year when Pakistan may turn into a water-scarce country, unable to meet its water needs. Existing reservoir storage capacity cannot sustain Pakistan's population boom, while river flow has also been reduced over the years. Pakistan can get more economic, social, and environmental benefits from better water use. But it's subject to continuous reforms to improve water use efficiency and service delivery, and create awareness among the general public. In Lahore, Pakistanis are rising to the challenge to put pressure on politicians across Pakistan to do more. People don't understand how bad it is. There are, just this year, there were floods, uh, unexpected rains in Punjab that wiped out a substantial portion of the wheat crop that affected people's livelihoods. 
And for a country where a quarter of the population is at or near the poverty line, a single event like that, one rain, is the difference between getting a, a square meal a day or not. In a country beset with problems, only 4% think that climate change is an issue. Rafe wants to change this attitude. He's taking his family to the climate march to raise awareness amongst kids in Pakistan. Uh, children. So you're going to be leading the march? No, we're going to be helping organize it. The children who are leading the march, students, not us. All right, so we've got March in Mia Valley currently under uh, progress. The youth of Pakistan are concerned about their future when the impact of climate change may worsen. Pakistan has been started and it's been spectacular. Now there are about 45 cities, 40-45 cities that are coming out of Lahore and Pakistan. And the aim was to show people that this is not an issue of the elites. The climate change is not an issue. More than 5,000 marches take place worldwide along with Lahore on the same day. The climate strike is the largest ever collective call to action in the world. My government is the biggest polluter in history and should be doing something about it, but instead, President Trump doesn't even believe in climate change and wants to pull us out of the Paris Agreement. I find it completely unacceptable, especially because my friends and in-laws here in Pakistan are the ones who are already suffering the most from the impacts of climate change. We global warming is happening. In the north, the ice is melting. We are in danger of the ice. 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 The population is increasing. The pollution is increasing. There is no place. Our weather is bad. We are in the middle of the night. We are in the middle of the night. We are in the middle of the night. Pakistan contributes less than 1% of the world's greenhouse gases. Yet, it is the world's sixth most vulnerable country affected by climate change. While it must develop a robust foreign policy that allows it to effectively negotiate climate issues with its neighbors, Pakistan's march to solve its climate problems has begun.